esteemed ministers, Anita and others, highnesses, excellencies. Great pleasure to be here. Thanks to Dieter for bringing me here. It's been a great pleasure working with the team. Work together great. So I'm going to speak about the next 10 years. You may notice I have a bit of a cold, so if I uh, go off in a couple of seconds, then you just stand, stay with me and don't go away. So let's start with this one. You know, I've been a futurist for 20 years, and it's been an interesting realization in the last couple of years that the future is no longer an extension of the present. 20 years ago, we talk about the future, we talk about tomorrow, you know, science fiction. Today, we talk about the future, we're talking about today. Right? That is a strange thing. Right? So being a futurist is kind of like just being an you know, average person, because the future is here. The future isn't tomorrow. We can connect our brain to the internet using brain-computer interfaces. We can do supercomputing. We're working on quantum computing, right? We have nuclear fusion being trialed in different places. We have artificial intelligence working on healthcare. Right? We have the first doctor in China who used CRISPR-Cas9 to operate, change the human genome. Mind-boggling. And of course, then there's all the wild cards that we didn't think of. The pandemic, the war. Right? So many things about the future. Most importantly, we have to think about the future as being exponential. Right? It's not what we are. We are linear. We're organic. So we all get to live a little bit longer now. We're learning, we're growing. You know, my kids will be an average of 100 years old because of that curve. But we're not computers, we're not exponential. Moore's law, Metcalfe's law, right? Wright's law. Basically, we're leaping into the future. The second most important point is this. Right? We're actually not like this. A lot of people feel this way today, right? Because what can we do about, you know, there's Putin, there's Russia, there's the Chinese, there's inflation, there's COVID, there's the bad people in Davos, there's like a long list, right? I mean, if you want to take a look at the long list of bad things, right, it's basically from here until the end of the building. Okay. If I speak to my own kids, my older one is 33. He talks about this, right? He feels like a turtle on the back, can't do anything. But it's kind of like... Right? We have to realize the future is not something that just happens to us. If we make it. It's not made in Silicon Valley. It's not made in China. Right? It's not just dropping down on us. I live in Switzerland. I'm from Germany originally. German people are very much into perfection. Surprise. Right? So the future for them is suspicious because it can't be perfect, right? It's made up. In America, it's all about the future, about making everything up. It's completely the other way around. If you go to America or Brazil, it's all like the future is, yeah, everybody wants to make the future, right? It's interesting here in Europe, we have this problem. We like the past, sometimes we like the present, and the future makes us suspicious. That is a very big mistake, because the future isn't hypothetical. Right? It's arriving here today. So I set out last year, in the middle of the COVID pandemic, make a film called The Good Future, shot in Lanzarote, if you've ever been there. I, I used the landscape to, point, to, to paint the picture of what a good future could look like. It's kind of ironic, you know, when I, the film is quite popular now, you can see it at thegoodfuturefilm.com, but it's ironic when I speak, people are saying, what are you talking about, good future? Haven't you noticed everything's bad? Especially now. So what about the good future? Barbara Hubbard, who was a disciple of Buckminster Fuller, said, as you see the future, so you act. As you act, so you become. Keep that in mind when you think about the future of education. We think the future will not work out, it will be bad, everything is going to be a problem. This is what we create. It's called self-fulfilling prophecy, of course. But let's think positively about the future. The bottom line is what education is. Education needs to enable us to see and hear and create the future. Because again, it's not 
science fiction anymore. It's next week. I call this the future mindset. So the question I have for you, do you have a future mindset? Are you paying attention? Right? And again, I lived in America for 17 years. And there, it's really normal to think about what is not already here. And it's the, the vision of the future is just completely normal there. So as a, as a first point, let's remind ourselves our attitude contains our future. And that's, we have, think about our attitude when we think about education, what is possible, what is doable. And this is what determines our future. So as we're leaping, we have to remind ourselves of the exponential change. You know, basically the process is very simple. If you go linear, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, it's one after the other. But if you go exponential 30 times, it's basically 26 times around the planet. That's what technology does, and it's doing it right now. We're at the pivot point, four. The next step isn't five or six, right? it's eight, 16, 32. In 10 years, 256. So your kids, if you have kids, right, if once they come out of school, for example, they live in a world that's going to be 80 to 100 times as different as today in 10 years, and a billion in 20 years. How in the world are we going to educate our kids, whether it's kindergarten or wherever, university, colleges, to deal with this kind of scenario? First and foremost, we have to tell them to invent and to create. You know, there's been a great Dell study, widely quoted, that says roughly 70% of all new jobs in 2030 don't even exist yet. Think about that for a second. How do you train people to do a job that doesn't exist? 12 years ago, 10 years ago, there was almost no social media. Today, 21 million people work in social media. 21 million new jobs. Where do they come from? Where do they go to? How do you train for social media? Well, you do it. Right? And you work remotely, you work on the cloud. So very important to keep that in mind where things are going here, because this is the list of things that are going wrong. It's only a partial list, right? World Economic Forum. So. Social cohesion problems, livelihood, climate action failure, mental health deterioration, extreme weather debt crisis. Well, you won't sleep if I read the whole thing. What do we need to solve this? I call this perma change. Right? It's like, you know, we're living in a world where this is actually not going to get much better. This is, a, this is basically what we have. Right? And this perma change, the next 10 years, will bring more change than the previous 100 years. Imagine if we invent, for example, nuclear fusion. Well, we're working very hard on that. There's trillions of dollars going into this, right? It would mean abundant energy in 10, 15, 20 years. Imagine if we actually get to figure out how we can prevent cancer by analyzing the human genome. So that's all in the, in the space of the next two decades. Here you see some graphs on this. This one is important as we're looking at basically technology is making everything cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Whether it's human DNA analysis or AI computing, cloud computing. The next one shows you again healthcare. What's switching here on global digital healthcare? I mean, healthcare is becoming digital. That means we're going to use data and analytics to drive the future. Here you see what's happening with artificial intelligence. It's going to make paralegals and office and admin support four times as efficient by using intelligent tools. Does that mean some will be replaced? Probably. I mean, if your job is routine, 90%, you're not going to fare very well here, right? Because that's what machines do, they do routine, you know, monkey work, basically. Right? And this is, of course, what's happening all around us. Again, exponential climate change. There's a lot of people saying the next 100 unicorns, you know, billion dollar companies, will be in climate technology. 
World Economic Forum says 300 million new jobs in climate technology in the next 20 years. Green is the new digital. Right? This is basically what's happening. So we're moving into a world of technology, into a world that's essentially kind of upside down. Right? And I'm going to give it to you straight here. Right? Traditional education, as we have it now, is unfit for this exponential perma-change future. And of course, you know, we are kind of suspecting this already for some time, right, that we have to amend how we teach. I mean, I went to University of Bonn, I studied philosophy and comparative religion, and then I went to music school, 1986 in Boston. What did I learn at music school? How to play every scale, in every key, in every position, flawlessly, on demand. Was that helpful? Yeah. I learned Hebrew, Latin, and Greek in university. Was that helpful? I'm not so sure. Do I use it there somewhere? Yes. But you know what I'm really using today in my last 20 years of my work? Is to learn how to unlearn. Right? How to question my assumptions. How to force myself to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's my job. Right? And how to stay alive and positive, that's what I do now. We're living in this world. The military says VUCA. Right? You know that word, I'm sure. Volatile, unorthodox, chaotic, and ambiguous. And what we have to do now is we have to flip this. Because the VUCA isn't going away. It is going to be out of velocity, speed, unorthodoxy, co-creation, and the good old American word, Awesomeness. How do we get somebody to be awesome in school? Can we teach that? Well, this is a life skill, obviously, right? Velocity, unorthodoxy. When I talk about unorthodoxy, I remind myself of Richard Branson. You know, the UK entrepreneur, virgin, and so on. Right? He started 267 companies. He's dyslexic, lexic, right? I mean, his... His skill of starting things, he just doing new things is mind-boggling. Right? So in this perma-change world, we're going to have to go down this way. Buckminster Fuller, famous futurist, designer, polymath, one of my great mentors, he says, all children are born geniuses, but 99.99 out of every 10,000 are swiftly and inadvertently de-geniused by grown-ups. He actually said that the schools serve a primary purpose, which, which is to remove the genius. I wouldn't be that hard, you know, but... Let's, we have to think about this, right? What do we need? Do we need a workhorse, like in the old days, the postal horse that brings the mail? Right? Or do we need racehorses? You know, do we need kids to go faster and quicker? So as we're moving into this future, it's quite clear we're heading into a series of revolutions. You know, this one was uh, 150 years ago, 100 years ago, digital revolution now. Right? And this is the big one that's happening right now, the sustainability revolution, the green revolution. And the last one that we're talking about today is this one, the human revolution, the human renaissance. You know, why is it important to be human? Well, because machines aren't human, and we shouldn't make them human. We shouldn't strive to make them like us. They're just tools. I know if, if, if you've ever driven a self-driving car, I've tried many times, they don't drive like humans. They do a very good job. You know, I fall asleep in Los Angeles because of jet lag. I did that two times. And the Tesla has taken me safely in the traffic jam, and I'm sleeping. Not supposed to, but works. Right? Good purpose. Take the self-driving car to Beirut or Rome. It will last about two and a half seconds. Right? Humans are not machines. And this is why education needs to think about what we do in the human renaissance and this picture of how we're going to come together 
the most powerful thing is that we're looking at an education revolution. Just like a digital revolution and the green revolution. The next Google will be in education. Because education is no longer about teaching kids or colleges, so it's lifelong. And we're going to see many people work in the cloud remotely. How do they study? Where do they learn their new skills? How are they going to get what they need? Because let's face it, this is the reality. Right? Humans and machines. More and more and more intelligent systems. But here's the thing, of course, human intelligence and AI, artificial intelligence, are completely different things. Now, our intelligence, according to Gartner and many others, roughly eight to ten different kinds of intelligence. Kinesthetic, social, emotional. For example, studies have shown that women have a much higher EQ than men. And many of the countries run by women in the COVID times were more successful than those run by older men. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's kind of like... Okay, so what does it mean? Which way do we have to go? We're living in these days. You know the Vitruvian man, Leonardo da Vinci, right? I want you to meet the Neoluvian Neo man, the New Age man, woman. Right? Surrounded by a technology. Just one second, please. So, the Neoluvian woman, man, is surrounded by data, cloud computing, the Internet of Things, right? And how important it will be for us to remind ourselves who we are when we do this. We're not technology just because we want to use lots of technology. Right? Because the purpose is different. The interesting thing is, of course, technology is no longer stupid. I mean, when you use Google Maps or Google Translate, yeah, it's very stupid sometimes, right? But it's getting better. You know, the other day was a Swiss couple going to Rio de Janeiro, and they used Google Maps to find their way from the hotel to, from the airport to the hotel. And Google Maps put them straight through the favela at 8 o'clock in the evening. It was the quickest way. They were almost killed okay? because of that. That's how stupid technology still is. But, having said so, now you're seeing all these pretty amazing improvements of technology. I'll show you some examples. Sound good? You should be seeing what I'm saying, just transcribed for you in real time, kind of like subtitles for the world. What we're working on is technology that enables us to break down language barriers. Taking years of research in Google Translate and bringing that to glasses. Do you see me? In this video, you will learn how to react in the case of an unhappy customer in one of our stores. O atendimento ao cliente é fundamental e é necessário aprender a lidar com clientes irritados e descontentes que podem não ter recebido o nível de serviço que esperavam. This is an AI that does the translation and the lip-syncing, called Synthesia. Right? Does it mean we won't have translators? I think it's unlikely. But if it works, this tool, GPT-3, can analyze the content of any packaging, food, pills, whatever, and it's going to look up all the pieces that's in it on the internet and give you a list of what's in it. My eyes. Kind of interesting, right? Is it, is it existential? No, but I mean, think about this for a second, right? That's actually possible now. And this one. Dolly 2 is a system from OpenAI that can take text like a koala dunking a basketball and turn it into an image that never existed before. It can also create new variations of pre-existing images. Through deep learning, Dolly understands the relationship between text and images. Dolly can edit this image of a monkey doing something new, like paying its taxes, well, you know, a monkey paying taxes is, of course, a really important development, right? But think about this for a second. I can speak to GPT-3 and I, I can have it program an app for me. I can say I need an app that does the following, and it does the programming for me. It makes a spreadsheet by speaking to it. 
What does it mean for people who do make spreadsheets? Well, they have to move up the food chain. Right? Basically, what's happening is that anything that can be digitized or automated will be. Anything. If you make non-disclosure agreements as a lawyer, if they're really simple, they're already kind of automated, right? <laughs> Cut and paste. If you do financial advice, there's already systems that do that online for people in many places. It's basically the end of routine. How much routine do you do? I look at my own work and say I do about 40, 50% routine, and I try to get rid of it by using a smart machine. So I can do other things. But I don't want to get rid of the routine that I need. Some things are routine, but I, you know, I value them. So the important part is, as we're looking at this future, data, information, logic, and explicit knowledge is becoming abundant. Okay, I'll give you the, the difference between uh, data and understanding. You know, if you come home in the evening, you meet your kids, your son, he's 13 years old, he tells you about how he took the bus and what kind of grades he has, that's called data. Right? But then he says nothing, and you're looking at him, and he has a really stupid grin on his face. You realize he's fallen in love for the first time in his life. That's called understanding. That's what humans do. It's very difficult for machines to do this, but basically, as we're moving into this future, it's quite clear. If you work like a robot, a robot will take your job. Do not teach our kids to be robots. And this is what we've been doing, unfortunately. To learn, memorize, download, keep for later, repeat. That sometimes actually works, right? <laughs> but here's the worst one. If you learn like a robot, you'll end up working for them. We have to get away from this thinking that we can robotize what we know and which way we're going into this future. Because as machines become intelligent, most of our work will be what's called human-only work. What's human-only work? Understanding, debating, negotiating, designing, creating, uh, foreseeing, putting things together. Jeff Bezos, probably the most important internet guy in the last two decades, he always says he's looking, he's looking at lots of data to make decisions. The other day he said, I make all my decisions by looking at data and then ignoring it by following my intuition. Okay? That's what humans do. That's what makes us different. Look at the new jobs of the future. Risk managers, ethics officers, data quality supervisors, nature deficit therapist. That would be a great job to have. Right? A rewilder, a nature agent. You know, sort of unknown jobs that we're looking at. Human-only jobs. One million people in India graduate every year with an engineering degree. 50, 60 percent of those end up working 300 dollar jobs a month, doing very simple engineering like building bridges and roads. And, right? You do not think that a machine can build a bridge? They can. Will engineers like this have a job in the future? they will have to change. Like I said earlier, right? I used to be in the music business. There were record stores. Remember those round things? Records? Yeah. Today, if you buy a CD or a DVD, you give it to your kids for Christmas, they call a therapist. Right? Completely changed. Right? This is the future of the music business. You have people who are doing data mining, making playlists on Spotify, who make musical memes, who amplify data. Right? They're doing all of that based on Spotify. Those are all new jobs. How do they learn them? Well, most of these people are, of course, musicians, right? They learn by doing. Why isn't there a class for this? Right? To create a vocational study. So, how AI could change the job market, you see this polarization. The jobs that are more on the creative side, health, scientific, technical, communications, growing because of AI. Other jobs, financial insurance, transportation, manufacturing, shrinking. Because all the jobs, 
that require us to be human are growing, right? Like I said earlier, machines are for answers, humans are for questions. That's Dali, but also Kevin Kelly, another futurist. So this here is already our reality. Just go to a lab for a big pharma company. This is what they do, they do cloud experiments. Right? Rather than doing them in the lab, they do them in the cloud for 100 trillion copies, and then they do them in the lab. I mean, it's digital twins, production. So here's the most important slide for today. It's the pyramid of work, which impacts the pyramid of education. To put it to you brutally without a filter, okay, this part down here, the red box, that's machine turf. Okay, data, logic, information, and some kind of knowledge. When machines have knowledge, that's why it's called deep learning, right? And machine learning, it's completely different than our knowledge, because our knowledge is embodied, right? Every therapist tell you, tell, will tell you that we don't learn with the brain, we learn with the body, right? It's not that simple for humans. We, we feel things, we hear things, we have goosebumps, we, you know, machines don't do that. But machine knowledge, a machine having looked at 100 trillion data feeds of possible melanoma will have an opinion of a sort. Could be very useful. Right? On the other side, that's called the meat space in science fiction. You, we are meat, right? Meat, flesh. Right? That's the turf that makes us human. Understanding, tacit knowledge. Like I do most of my engagement, people understand what I do through tacit knowledge. I don't call them and say, yes, I believe the following, you know. And we get married to our partners not because they have lots of logic and data. You don't get married because of efficiency, right? Unefficiency can be a problem, right? <laughs> we get married because of all of this. And so this is our future kind of beyond simple knowledge. That's why it's so useless that we memorize all this knowledge that keeps getting bigger. And there's a use for it, right? As long as we can maintain it, like I did. It's really about this. Human agency, consciousness. It's a great book called Beyond Knowledge that you should read by a friend of mine, Bill Halal, that talks about exactly this. This is happening in the next decade. Knowledge is good, but machine knowledge is for machines. That's why we have them. We should not let machines decide immigration issues, right? Or, or jail sentences or things like that, right? But a machine can be a very good slave for a good doctor right, to understand the data. So this is what's happening in our world. We've looked a long time in this direction, STEM, right? For the future. And it's been good. It's always good to be in STEM, right? regardless. Right? But here's the thing that we have to learn from the last couple of years. Now it's about this, what I call hecky in my book. Humanity, ethics, creativity, imagination. Even Einstein already said imagination is more important than knowledge. But of course, he was Einstein, right? So <laughs> he did have a bit of knowledge. So. But in the end, it's not both of those things. It's the combination between EQ and IQ. But I'll tell you one thing. Today, I wouldn't be betting on being smarter than the machines. Today, maybe five years, no, 10 years, definitely not. Some people always will be, Einstein type people. We're going to have to think about learning in a different way. Problem based learning, for example. Having a problem, applying possibilities, learning, applying to solve the problem not learning based necessarily on lessons. Right? And yes, some of that is going to be virtual. Because it can be. Because we're learning in COVID, we all learned how to do this. It was okay. It was not great. You know, we have a lot of anxiety about this, but it's working. We must, in the future, unlock the skills and unlock the mind and the body. That's the toughest one for me, 
right? We have to unlock the mind. Like Buckminster said, right? Put the genius back. Right? And how do we do that? If I could just... Just one second, there was an animation I missed. By doing the obvious skills of a human. I call this the androrhythms, the human things. Where do our kids learn this? On the street, on the job. They have to learn this at school. Right? Life skills, character traits. Great example is the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern. Uh, a brilliant example of how somebody can turn this around. This is what she says about how the government of New Zealand works. If I could distill it down into one concept that we are pursuing in New Zealand, it is simple and it is this. Kindness. Can you imagine the German Chancellor saying that? Or the Swiss top seven that we have? It's a paradigm. Think about this, what that will do for our future, which way we're going. We have to get away from this concept that learning and education is all about this getting more efficiency and productivity. I think that was somewhat true before COVID. But you know what really matters today? It's not efficiency, optimization, it's all of those things, right? Resilience, agility, intuition, compassion. How do we teach that? Can that be taught? How does that happen? When I went to music school, apart from learning all the scales and chords, in every possible variation. My best experience was testing a class with Quincy Jones, you know, the composer, the arranger, right? Who fired me out of the class after four seconds. Right? Who said to me, I couldn't sight read well enough. He said, get out, there's 200 other people waiting. It was brutal. But that was a message I understood, you know, it helped me to figure out who I was. And then there's this, right? Why do we keep looking to virtual reality and the metaverse and, you know, whatever devices for what we are, right? We have to connect back to nature. There's a great, uh, actually, there's a symptom now called the nature deficit disorder. Right? Not spending enough time in nature. Of course, I live in Switzerland, you know, we, this is what we do. We have to look at the future more holistically. The solution isn't in the screen. You will not find happiness in the cloud or in an app or on your mobile phone. What you find there is hedonism. And hedonism is okay. I don't have nothing against it. I mean, it's great for me that I can listen to 62 million songs on Spotify, right? Or call everybody in the world for free. That's great. But is it happiness? That's a different story. Is this happiness as we're working on with my special guest star for today, Mark Zuckerberg? Sense of presence, shared physical space, those chance interactions that make your day all accessible from anywhere. Now imagine that you have your perfect work set up and you can actually do more than you could in your regular work set. And on top of all that, you can keep wearing your favorite sweatpants. Yeah, well, that's pretty cool, right? Thank you, Mark, for being here. Okay, I can't hear him. Can you hear him? No, he's just, I'm just kidding, he's not really there. But this is what he said about virtual reality, right? It's about the time when immersive digital worlds become the primary way we live our lives. Now, this is utterly pathetic, right? Right? I think we agree, you know? I mean, in fact, it's an insult for anybody who is a humanist, right? It's like... What in the world are you talking about? This is Mark's last desperate effort to bring his stocks back. Right? I say the opposite. Right? I say the opposite of what Mark is saying in his famous videos, no sound on this one. Right? This is how he's showing us the metaverse, where you can go and pick a suit that looks actually better than he does. Um, but here's my response to this. It's about our actual lives to live to the fullest extent possible, supporting that with great technology. That's what it's all about. It's not the other way around. I don't live to become technology, and this is education should honor that as well. So what we're gonna see in education technology, virtually and otherwise, 
and even in virtuality. A couple obvious things. Flexible delivery, IRL in real life, right? and virtually, globally, instantly. That's very important. I mean, your country could become a global hub for this kind of education, virtually and in real life. Language translation is coming. Give it five years. We can, I mean, in, I think in a year or so, we can speak to WhatsApp and hear it in Chinese. You know, get an instant translation. Technology educational programs, personalized offerings. Next, Google is in education. This is clearly what's happening around us. It's a huge opportunity. So when I look at virtuality, I look at this and say, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, I'm a geek. I, I try everything, right? But then I come to the realization after two years of COVID, right? one hug is worth a thousand Zoom calls. It's not giving me what, I'm, what it's supposed to do, but it, there's basically the, the realization that what we're doing online is useful, but what we do offline also has its use, right? It's just completely different. Sorry, I didn't make a very good point with this, but technology, or can you say, it's not always on your side. Right? So, some suggested action items, and then I'll be done. The first question that we have to ask, what kind of future do you want for your children, for yourself, for your grandchildren? You know, when I ask myself that question, my kids are 26 and 33, I have a lot of questions to answer. Yeah. Like they're saying to me, I'm 61, right? Most of the climate change problems in the world were caused by people like me, our age, right? We created two-thirds of the entire CO2 that our kids have to live with. And then I'm wondering, are they going to live in a world where there's no jobs because they don't have the skills? And how do we balance this? So one of my, old, one of my older sons, he, uh, he said he doesn't want to do an MBA. Rather, he wants to go travel in India for a year. I said, great idea, I'll give you some money. Just don't get killed. Oh, do it right. And I think it was much better than any MBA he could have gotten. Right? I mean, it's just a different kind of education. Many of us may feel this way right now, especially with the war going on and the inflation. Closed doors. But you know, I think it's actually a little bit different. I think the doors are opening now. And we're going to see a great opening next year. We may, in fact, head into kind of a strange golden era. I know this is very optimistic, right? Given what we have right now. But I'm with Gramsci, who said, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will is what we need. We can be intellectually pessimistic and question things, but we have to have optimism of the heart to build education in new ways. Going back to this, right? Velocity, unorthodoxy, co-creation. I'd rather have my kids be awesome than be truly intellectual overachievers. I mean, if they can be both, then even better. Right? Unlikely, unfortunately. And also, a key message, the future is better than we think. Stop paying attention to social media telling you that everything is bad and that everybody's evil and everybody's an autocrat and we can get nothing done. Right? That's what's being amplified in media. Especially if you watch Black Mirror, anything on Netflix, right? the future is going to end bad for us, the robots will take our jobs, and then they will harvest our bodies for energy. Right? That's the outcome. So, in a nutshell, as we're looking at this future, Marshall McLuhan already said, education must shift from instruction to discovery, to creation. That was 1964. How long will it take for us <laughs> to make those changes, to shift the discovery and empowerment and creation? Imagination. How do you learn that? How do you put it together? C.K. Prahalat, Indian philosopher, says, imagine the future may be more important than analyzing the past. Now, I think if you're an academic, you may have an issue with that, you know, analyzing the past or the present, right? But imagine the future, right? We're imagination-bound. 
we're no longer resource bound. All of the action is in ideas and concepts. So a couple of quick bullets. We have to prioritize imagination, intuition, and human agency. Go beyond this efficiency obsession, fitting people into slots. Right? We have to end this artificial separation of school and life. That is deadly. Right? Young and old, like only young people study. Right? We're going to live in a world where a 75-year-old man will have his 47th career. I mean, this is the world that we're going into, a new situation. We have to cultivate character, personality, mindset, right? not just logic. Again, there's nothing wrong with logic. If you're brilliant in logic and mathematician, that's also great, right? But we're going to need both. We have to bring degrees and experiences on the same level. More vocational training, more short-term agreements, right? more possibility to learn new things. Teach less in subjects. I, I can think of nothing worth than, uh, worse than this concept of teaching a subject, you know, English and history. And, right? Let's work on problems. Let's do a climate change class that looks at physics and biology and politics and language and you know, looks at all those things together. Let's pursue flow. You know, if you're an artist, you know what flow is, right? Flowing along into the job, right? Stop downloading, right? It doesn't work. And there's too much stuff to download. We have to engage, not memorize. If you can memorize a little bit, that's always good. Right? Nothing wrong with it. The key to the future is this. Awesome humans on top of amazing technology. And that's really what education should be all about when we're looking at this future, right? what I call the good future. And this concept, let's have a different narrative. Humans aren't useless because technology is getting smart. Far from it. Let them get smart and drive my car. Who cares? Right? Because I have more time. I can do different things. Let's get rid of people propagating that we have a useless real life. You know, that we have to live in virtual reality because real life is so bad. Right? I don't know why they're still here and talking about this. Right? Buckminster again. We are to be architects of the future, not victims. And we have to get our kids and our students to think about being architects of their own future rather than victims of the present. Thank you very much for your time.